What's going on, everybody? Ian Harditz here on behalf of PFF. Welcome to another week of BR Fantasy. By weeks here. It's week six. It's always a great day. It'd be great, though. Before we get into today's topic, I want to go through some key injury news from around the NFL, and we're always having more injuries to deal with. Unfortunately, with that said, Saints wide receiver room remains all kinds of banged up right now. Michael Thomas, we heard last Sunday from ESPN's Adam Schefter that he had a good chance of suiting up this week, yet to return to practice, though, with that foot injury. Also, still have Jarvis Landry on the sideline with the ankle injury, but Chris Alave did get back to a limited practice despite having that scary concussion last week. So, I would think with the new NFL concussion protocol rules going in that Alave, again, after that nasty injury he had last week, won't be out there. But based on the practice participation, he might actually have the best chance of all these Saints wide receivers. Looking at Dallas, Dak Prescott for the first time since messing up his right thumb back at practice in a limited fashion. Still tentatively expecting Cooper Rush to be under center, but this might actually be the final week we see the ginger Jesus if Dak is ready to go by week seven. We do have Damon Harris still very much limited with that hamstring injury. He is considered week to week, and that means it is finally Ramondre Stevenson RB1 season. Might have taken, you know, four or five different things to go his way to happen, but they happen. So here we are. Fire up Ramondre Stevenson and fantasy lineups of all shapes and sizes. Got to note that Rashad Bateman still not practicing with that foot injury. It's bye weeks. It's, I get it. It's tough times right now. If you need a wide receiver, good chance Devin DuVernay is still on your waiver wire. Also note that Jonathan Taylor back at practice despite dealing with that ankle injury, expecting him to be good to go. They did have an extra long week to get him ready after obviously missing last week's Thursday night atrocity against the Broncos. Please, Jonathan Taylor, for all of us that have to watch Colts games every week, get back there, start doing your thing again. And finally, everyone, this Cardinals backfield, go get Eno Benjamin. If you, yeah, if, you, if he's available on your waiver wire, keep watching, please. We always enjoy having you here. But then go get Eno Benjamin because he is setting up to be a fairly featured back in Arizona this week. James Conner, doubtful with a rib injury, and Daryl Williams already ruled out with a knee injury. So, I understand this Arizona backfield. Look, this whole offense, really, other than Marquise Brown and Kyler Murray to an extent, we haven't seen consistent high-end performances, but there's only a handful of coaches really willing to give their overall RB1 a true workhorse role. Arizona and Cliff Kingsbury has been one of them over the years. So make sure you keep keep an eye on all these injuries throughout the week. They're always updating, and you can always check out the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast on Friday where I'll get you covered with all those fantasy-relevant injuries each and every week. But with that said, everyone, let's get things started. This is be our fantasy live presented by state farm and we got a great show for you today panic or relax is the theme of the show look we we all have a player on our fantasy teams that we're currently dealing with this it's only been five weeks we drafted them for a reason but so far that reason has not come to fruition do we panic or do we relax i'm here to help you find out and we have eight different players that to go through and determine just that so starting things off with los angeles rams quarterback matthew stafford guys just the qb 23 so far this season not exactly what we were hoping for when he really again was being prioritized well ahead of some guys like jared goff Geno smith carson wentz guys that are actually giving us more fantasy points right now than what we got out of stafford so with stafford it has been brutal guys again qb 23 overall but on a weekly basis, QB 30, QB 10, QB 29, QB 29, and most recently QB 15. So the volume has actually been there over the last two weeks. Only Brady and Matthew Stafford have triple digit dropbacks. So the hope is that the Sean McVay offense can't stay this bad for this long. Guys, because even the worst version of the Jared Goff Rams offense really wasn't this bad. If you look at the Rams ranks, just an overall scoring under Sean McVay since 2017, First, second, 11th, 22nd in the bad golf year, and then seventh last season. So the bigger concern, I think, for staff from this offense is just the lack of anywhere to go with the ball if it's not being thrown to Cooper Cup or Tyler Higby at this point. We'll talk about Allen Robinson a little bit more in a bit. Spoiler right there. But so far, guys, this Rams offense, 31st in PFF pass blocking grade and 31st in rushing. So, yeah, they're 28th in passing. Stafford hasn't exactly been helping things. Single lowest rate of catchable deep balls in the entire league. And, you know, with that in mind, guys, we got our panic meter to show you all. I am 
am panicking. I am not relaxing. We are in the red for a reason here. This offense looks completely broken, and I'm not so sure someone like Van Jefferson or Odo Beckham coming off of the, you know, coming off an ACL tear, even if he does re-sign with the Los Angeles Rams, are going to be enough to be able to fix this unit. Again, it's not just on Stafford. It's on the entire offensive line, the run game, and accordingly, Sean McVay as well for continuing to be unable to get this offense to literally just be average, because that's the problem here. It's not that Stafford and company relative to expectations are not meeting them it's that Stafford and company are literally a bottom five offense in the NFL right now so I don't think Stafford will be completely unusable down the stretch but it's time to adjust your expectations and really start treating Stafford far more as a matchup dependent QB2 than someone that needs to be started each and every week Love all you guys in the chat with us. We'll continue to get to all your questions throughout today's show, starting off with Jake Winters. Thoughts on DeAndre Hopkins when he returns. So what the really interesting part is going to be for this, in my opinion, is Rondale Moore. So Hopkins, first week he's back, get him back in those starting lineups. You know, he's been staring at us for quite some time. Uh, you know, I sent out a tweet on Monday from the office where, you know, it was Creed walking up behind Jim and just giving him the shoulder rub one more week. That's been Hopkins on our fantasy bench here, uh, just waiting to get back in there. So I'm excited about Hopkins. I think some of his decline last year has been overstated. It was just a matter of Kyler Murray really spreading the ball around. So having Hollywood Brown in the offense, yes, there only is one ball to go around, but come on guys, it's DeAndre Hopkins. They paid him all that money for a reason. He is going to be involved, but the real question is going to be, will it be Hopkins on one side, Hollywood Brown on the other and Rondale Moore in the slot, or are they going to do what they did last year and keep Rondale Moore off the field in favor of old man, AJ Green. So we'll worry about that next week. This week though, guys, if you need a wide receiver, Rondale Moore set up brilliantly in the slot against the Seahawks defense that has been bottom five in any metric you want to look at against slot receivers. From Mickey W, should I start Taysom Hill this week? Hey, man, it depends. It's one of those things where, hey, I get it with Taysom. It's really hard to actually rank more than 10 or 12 tight ends ahead of the guy because when you start looking past, you know, 10 or 11 tight ends, all of a sudden you're looking at guys that, yeah, they're going to have more snaps than Taysom, but Taysom is kind of breaking the mold of everything we've thought we've known about fantasy tight ends because his snaps aren't up there, but when he is on the field, he's getting the football. So for me, I have Taysom Hill ranked as my overall tight end of 14 this week. I will play Taysom Hill ahead of guys like Dalton Schultz, Cole Komet, Tyler Conklin. With that said, you know, Hayden Hurst, Hunter Henry, Gerald Everett, I am still going to lean towards those guys a bit more. I don't think Taysom Hill is going to be ripping off 60-yard touchdown runs every single week as impressive as that week five performance was. From James Dolan, you know, Benjamin isn't going to last long term, though. You're not wrong, man, but it's this week. And hey, it's a week to week league out here, and we got to try to win them as much as we can. So, with James Conner, again, likely sidelined for at least this week, if not a few more. Daryl Williams already ruled out. It is, you know, Benjamin, top 15, top 20 running back season, at least for week six. So, I hear you. I mean, if you are a stacked team and like you're just not going to be starting Eno anyway, you don't need to pick them up. I would go look at guys like Rashad White, Jalen Warren, uh, you know, these true handcuffs that really have longer term potential if things break their way, but still a good position. If you, again, need a flex, need a starting running back, you know, Benjamin can be that guy for you here, at least in week six, if not a little bit beyond. All right, guys, now a second quarterback that's been disappointing. Now we got to decide if we are panicking or relaxing. Going to be Denver Broncos own Russell Wilson so far, just the QB 18 after five weeks of action. He did get us a nice little three touchdown performance in week four. He finished as the overall QB four that week. Otherwise, though, three finishes outside the top 20 signal callers over the past four weeks. And there's been a variety of problems here. His 14.6 rushing yards per game, second lowest mark of his career. The accuracy has been off. Every area of the field, short, intermediate, and deep. He's been ranking outside the top 20 quarterbacks in each. And there's also the reality that he's hurt. He's getting the injection in his shoulder. They're calling it a similar injury as to what Dak Prescott had to deal with last year. And yeah, Dak was able to overcome a lot of that with volume. But don't forget, guys, as impressive as that week one game was for Dak last year against Tampa Bay, throwing for over 400 yards and all that, serious questions about that arm strength and if he could be that same guy. So Russell Wilson, we've all seen his you know physical limitations before in terms of his height and being able to see over the line and all that. So if you do take away his ability to throw those patented moon balls downfield, I think it does make more sense why he has been struggling enough already. And also, guys, it's been five weeks with Nathaniel Hackett, Denver Broncos, brand new group of wide receivers. So a lot of variables going on. And with that, we once again go to our panic meter. <laughs> Thank you. 
sound scares me every time. We're going to be in orange here. I'm not completely freaking out on the, you know, let's ride experience just yet. Certainly hasn't been good. My main thought here with Russell Wilson is it's not so much an investment in Russ being this elite quarterback anymore. We just need him to be average, not the atrocity that he has largely been through the first five weeks of the season. We still have Sutton, Judy, KJ Hamler's health is improving. They're getting their rookie tight end, who's their best receiving tight end. Greg Dolch is coming off of IR. And based on what we saw last week, okay, a little bit of juice from Melvin Gordon, but just not having Javante Williams, I would not be surprised if the Broncos are just forced basically in the shootout happy AFC West and with, you know, again, not having the resources to really run the ball. Russell Wilson might have enough elite volume to make up for his lack of efficiency, but again, he needs a lot of things to go his way. So I will say Russ and Stafford, similar sentiment where I don't think they're completely unusable the rest of the year, but the days of looking at your lineup and you got Russell Wilson in the QB one spot and just completely disregarding the matchup, I do believe believe those are over. So, hey, find a second quarterback on the waiver wire. Don't be afraid to go matchup by matchup out there. Don't completely panic. Again, I still think there's enough talent in this Broncos offense to get some spike weeks all the way around. Clearly, though, the early returns not promising and expecting this to be the sort of top 10 offense that a lot of us were hoping they could be when this trade happened in the first place. From them boys in the chat, Danny Dimes or Jameis Winston for half PPR. So, Jameis is looking like he's going to be back there. He's still playing with the four fractures in his back, but the man's going to tough it out. If we can get even like two of these wide receivers back for Jameis, I will be fine going to him. Otherwise, I think it's going to be an offensive effort just completely centered around running the ball with Alvin Kamara and Mark Ingram. That's what it was last year before they got these receivers. The Saints were the single most run-heavy offense in the NFL uh, when Jameis Winston was under center in weeks one through six last season. So Daniel Dimes is actually, you know, it's funny we call him Danny Dimes, but but the actual reason we want to play him is because of his action is because of his legs. So fifth highest rushing pace on the season right now in terms of total attempts. So we'll talk a little about a little more about Daniel Jones as a potential week seven guy you can get by. Uh, but I would take Jameis if one or two of Chris Olave, Jarvis Landry, and Michael Thomas are able to suit up this week. From D Boom, Russell Wilson or Geno Smith this week. It, what a time to be alive, guys. Like, could you imagine even asking this question a month ago? But it's a very reasonable question with Geno Smith just completely dominating out there. I don't know how many more weeks Geno Smith needs to actually post, you know, top 10, top five quarterback numbers before we just kind of have to look at ourselves and go, well, yeah, I guess he is a top 10 quarterback in the year 2022. So I am going to give Geno Smith the nod right here. And this one is more so based on what I talked about the matchup. It's not that I'm going to have Geno over Russ every single week the rest of the season. But when we look at Geno this week in a potential pass happy shootout with the Arizona Cardinals defense that hasn't shown a great ability to slow down many passing attacks this season, I will take that over Russ's, you know, trip against Durham, Durham James and company in Los Angeles. And from Cam Fitz, what do you think about George Kittle? Should I keep him? Well, that's actually a great cr transition, Cam, because George Kittle actually is our next player we're going to talk about and whether we should be relaxing or panicking here. And guys, I really do think this could be the week for George Kittle. So a couple of reasons here why when we see the Falcons, we all know their best cornerback, A.J. Terrell. He's actually been traveling a lot more this year. He's been following the number one receiver all over the field week after week after week, generally doing a pretty good job. Michael Thomas had two nice contested uh, catch touchdowns in week one, but Amari Cooper came up on the losing side of things a couple weeks ago. And just in general, AJ Terrell, even if guys are able to win, okay, it's one of those things where, you know, great offense can beat great defense in the NFL, just like it does in basketball, still not an easy matchup with AJ Terrell. But what we've seen consistently is the other top receiver uh, actually start balling out away from AJ Terrell. So uh, Jarvis Landry in week one went for over hundred yards. Tyler Lockett had nine catches for 76 yards. Dalvin people, Jones, Chris Godwin, the list goes on and on. And while it could be Debo Samuel this week, either Debo or Kittle is going to blow the heck up. And I am going to lean towards Kittle because this Falcons defense just has not shown they can slow down tight ends all season long. Bottom three defense and targets, receptions, and receiving yards allowed to receiving tight ends. Yeah, guys, I'm not too worried. Let's go to the panic meter and show you guys not how worried I am. <laughs> It's green. We're good. I am not concerned about George Kittle. I believe this will be the eruption week where we're all going to be happy we drafted George Kittle in the fifth round in the first place. So I get it. It hasn't been ideal. We haven't found the end zone yet, but you got to remember, guys, he was injured to start the year. The left tackle jokes are being overblown. I mean, he's still running around in over 80% of Jimmy G's dropbacks on a weekly basis. This is an offense that, let's face it, they had Jimmy G coming back from a shoulder injury. They started the season with Trey Lance. Like, only as of last week, they actually leap out of the 
the bottom five offenses in terms of their points scored this year. So far better days to come for George Kittle, Brandon Ayuk, the whole collective offense. And again, with this mix matchup specifically, George Kittle should be in fantasy football lineups of all shapes and sizes. From Ryan Ribeiro, Kittle, you can start left tackles. Guys, that's what I'm saying. We pick like one or two plays where the guy was blocking, and we just assume that's not it. He ran a route on over 80% of Jimmy G's dropbacks last week. That happened. That's the elite number we look for with tight ends. The guy rarely leaves the field. Like, it's not George Kittle's fault. He's an incredible blocker and an incredible receiver. I maintain, if the aliens invaded us tomorrow and forced us to do, you know, a Space Jam type thing for football, George Kittle would be our tight end one. Travis Kelsey's awesome. Obviously, Mark Andrews is awesome. But in terms of their ability to block and catch, I don't think there's a better tight end on the planet than George Kittle. Whenever he's healthy, get him in those fantasy lineups. From Zachary McLaurin, should I panic? It's not great. Curtis Samuel, number one wide receiver in Washington this year in terms of targets, in terms of receptions. McLaurin does still have the edge in yards. I will say for right now with Jahan Dotson out of the picture, still with that hamstring injury. Look, I don't think Diami Brown's going to be getting two long touchdowns each and every week. I wouldn't be surprised if Terry is that guy here moving forward more weeks than not. The good news for Washington, as much as we do see the bad side of Carson Wentz, and even though his head coach, uh, own head coach wants to focus on that more than the good, we have at least seen a ceiling that really hasn't been there under Taylor. Taylor Heineke and some of these other quarterbacks they've had in recent years. So Carson Wentz, number one in the NFL and dropbacks. That's a lot of volume to get out. You know, some of the, again, rough patches that we know we're going to see still can be some goodness there for Terry and Curtis Samuel, especially when we have guys like Jahan Dotson and Logan Thomas not factoring in as heavily as we thought they might. From ETJ, Dawson Knox is a uh, dropping ball, right? Yeah, it's just a matter of him being so banged up right now. I mean, Quentin Morris last week actually showed out pretty well. He did have the goal line fumble, but he uh, was open for a touchdown, and he's just an athletic guy out there. So they paid Dawson Knox, but as long as he's going to be this banged up, I'm not as convinced he's going to have a featured role. Like, we're talking about the George Kittle left tackle thing. Dawson Knox is the one that wasn't able to even run a route on more than 60% of Josh Allen's dropbacks a lot of weeks. So Dawson Knox, not someone that needs to be on fantasy roster by any stretch of the imagination and from Travis, should i start hayden hurst over kyle pitts not quite sad that we got there and uh, we're gonna be talking about kyle pitts more right now let's get into it the tight end 23 on the season it's some bad guys like i'm, I'm not feeling good about this falcons offense at all which is wild because somehow the atlanta falcons are the 10th ranked offense in points per game this season but the problem for me guys it's not just pitts like pitts is Fine. We, we've seen him out there making the most out of his slim opportunities. It seemed like in the first few weeks of the year that it was going to be Drake London instead of Kyle Pitts. Well, we've taken Kyle Pitts out of the equation, and now Drake London isn't even giving us anything. Three straight top 36 finishes for Drake London to start the year, back-to-back -back games outside the top 50. And you want to complain about routes. I mean, look at the Atlanta Falcons. Olamide Zacchaeus was being used over Drake London uh, last week, which is just so ridiculous. But, you know, we'll continue to focus here on Kyle Pitts. So, again, it comes down to the volume. And, unfortunately, I don't trust Marcus Mariota to be, you know, like a Ryan Tannehill or someone that can actually enable his receivers to big days on limited volume this season. Only the Falcons and the Bears have actually been running the football on 50% or more of their plays, even, you know, when you exclude non even when you exclude, excuse me, garbage time situations. So on the season, Marcus Mariota, just four touchdowns. He's only averaging 185 passing yards per game. Those just aren't the sort of numbers that we can be expecting one, let alone two consistent high-end fantasy options out of so i think you guys can tell by the tone of my voice that things aren't looking great let's see how exactly bad they are with our panic meter all right it's red yeah not good i didn't quite go dark red because this is kyle pitts i still believe in the talent and it does seem like this hamstring injury isn't going to be long term he's been back at practice this week he says he expects to play kyle pitts is still going to be incredibly difficult to get out of your top six top eight tight ends more weeks than not it's just unfortunate that we drafted the guy in the third round so uh before the show you know we were just talking a little bit about sunk cost fallacy and not kind of having decisions you made in august and early september impact your decision making now so that'd be the one big thing I want to stress with Kyle Pitts. Yes, it's fair to just get your decisions and your just overall expectations for Kyle Pitts. Adjust those. That's fine. We have new information. We need to use that new information, but don't bench. Don't sell low on Kyle Pitts just because you're pissed off that you use a third round pick on him a couple months ago. He still is an incredibly talented second year tight end who should have some big days ahead. They're just going to be more boomer bust worthy because of the volume and the efficiency involved in this passing game. Similar sentiment there with Drake London. 
From Jazzy, is Jamar Chase going to pick it up? I really do think so, man. It's Jamar Chase. His volume really has still been fine. Unfortunately, we've seen Joe Burrow in this passing game not have the same success with the deep ball. As a rookie, Joe Burrow and company were the league's basically worst passing attack when trying to throw 20-plus yards downfield. Last season, anyone's idea of a top five unit, I think we all kind of assumed that was what happened when you add Jamar Chase to the equation. This year, they've kind of regressed to more of a middle-of-the-pack group. So I do think we'll see some bigger days out there. As much as the Zach Taylor experience, you know, hasn't exactly been great on a weekly basis with getting him going, we are still talking about a guy fresh off one of the most impressive rookie seasons at the position in NFL history. The volume's there. I really don't think Jamar Chase overnight became bad at football. Continue to treat him as a weekly top 10 option at the position albeit if we're taking them out of the top five i won't completely disagree with you there now just in time nice christian kirk time to panic so i would just say this jaguars offense unfortunately trevor lawrence is not looking like the same world beater just overall that he looked like in weeks two and three and that's the problem here because we have christian kirk not exactly completely pulling away from everyone maybe he is financially but we do have zay jones evan ingram even marvin jones factoring heavily into the passing game during any during any given week and unfortunately with trevor lawrence overall on the season you know pff's 28th highest graded passer among 35 qualified quarterbacks his yards per attempt are down we just haven't seen trevor lawrence be consistent enough for his number one wide receiver to be the same so i saw christian kirk as a top 24 wide receiver in full ppr scoring this week i think he's going to settle in as more as a you know borderline wide receiver too as opposed to top 12 options so another similar sentiment to like kyle pitts like it sucks that we can't be higher on christian kirk but still a quality guy that should be started in far more fantasy lineups than not and from S. Browning, Travis Etienne breakout. You guys are just setting me up so well with these transitions. Let's go into our running backs here and starting off with the RB37 himself, Travis Etienne. I'm feeling good about Etienne, guys, and it's both because of his uh, upward trajectory in terms of his usage. Yes, it has been a little bit game script and, and induced. You know, you look at weeks two and three beat down on the Colts in another position where they were able to surprisingly get up on the chargers to the extent that James Robinson was able to go out there and make everyone think he was the locked in RB one. And to his credit, you know, he ripped off the 37 to 51 yard touchdowns and he looked, you know, good out there. Obviously a great story coming back from the Achilles. But when you look at the whole season, our full five game sample size, Travis Etienne has been the better running back, guys, and you can look at anything you want. You can look at our PFF grades, Etienne 68.4, James Robinson 62.5, Maybe you're not a fan of PFF. I wish you were, but if you aren't, fine. Yards per carry, ETN 4.9, James Robinson 4.1. Yards after contact per carry, guess who has more? Travis ETN. Who's forcing more missed tackles per carry? Travis ETN. Yards per outrun, 1.36 versus 0.58. Yards per reception, 11.3 versus 5.6. I don't like taking away the players' big plays. They earned those plays. They happened. I, it's, it's annoying to me. But if you guys have watched the Jaguars games, you saw the fourth and one touchdown Robinson had against the Chargers. Like anybody could have run through that hole and gotten those 50 yards. If you take away those wide open touchdown runs that James Robinson has had this year, 2.97 yards per carry. Now, is that a factor of the offense? Absolutely. This Jaguars offense hasn't looked as good over the last two weeks as they did uh, during the first three of the season. But that's another factor that's going to help Travis Etienne because he outsnaps James Robinson when they are playing from behind, which all of a sudden is looking more and more likely for this 2022 versions of the Jaguars offense. So with that, let's get our panic meter. <laughs> I'm going to be yellow here with ETN relative to our preseason expectations. Obviously, James Robinson isn't going anywhere. And with this Jaguars offense, it can still seemingly go either way with their, them being either really good or really bad. But just with ETN, he looks great out there, which coming off the list, Frank injury, really, we couldn't assume going into this year. And at a minimum, we do have an explosive pass catching back involved in a two running back committee. So that's a big thing here with ETN. I'm not saying you can go out there on a weekly basis and fire him up as his top 20 option that you draft him to be. And that's why we are in a yellow stage of panic. I mean, you, he's not the guy that we draft him to be, and that's not necessarily going to change anytime soon. With that said, in full PPR, you're going to have an awfully hard time ranking more than 30 running backs ahead of him during any given week. He's still a solid flex option. And guys, God forbid something happens to James Robinson. All of a sudden, we could be talking about Travis Etienne as a weekly top 12 option. Look at guys like Ramondre Stevenson. Look at Kenneth Walker. You guys see what happens when one injury happens? 
to these two running back backfields. That's what's so big. So it's a new game these days, guys. We can't expect every running back to have a workhorse role. In the year 2000, I believe it was 19 different running backs had at least 300 touches. Last season, there were four. So when guys like Travis Etienne, you know, guys like even Cam Akers over there in Los Angeles, it's disappointing. We can't use them the way we thought we were going to use them, but it still is a two running back committee. And I know it sucks that you use a fourth round pick, you know, on a premier handcuff. That's only giving you a little bit of flex value. But again, that's a very valuable fantasy asset, even if you unfortunately had to overpay to get them a few months ago. From LA City, Zeke or Kenneth Walker this week. Absolutely Kenneth Walker. And it's probably going to be Kenneth Walker the rest of the season, taking us right here into our next running back, Ezekiel Elliott, just the RB38 on the year. And similar to a lot of these players, it's not just Zeke's fault. Football is obviously a team sport. And hey, guys, I'm a Columbus, Ohio lifer. If anyone should try to spew you, you know, some shenanigans about Zeke being fine, it's just been the offense's fault, it would be me. But we got a lot of red flags going on right here. And first of all, it's just the reality that this Cowboys offense offense isn't nearly as good as last season and it's not just because having Cooper Rush under center instead of Dak Prescott 24th in scoring this year PFF's 27th ranked offensive line in run blocking there's a lot of problems going on and also they're starting to affect Ezekiel Elliott we talked about George Kittle and kind of that fallacy around the idea that he's now this left tackle Ezekiel Elliott might as well be the left tackle in this conversation guys he is only on pace to catch 17 passes in 17 games 17 catches in 17 games his previous career low was 26 receptions in 2017 but that was when he was suspended and he only played 10 games so really they're either leaving him in the pass block or they're throwing the football at tony pollard who is averaging a full 1.8 rushing yards more than ezekiel elliott this season so no i don't think the cowboys are going to turn the backfield over to tony pollard they're too proud and to be fair like i think ezekiel elliott his ability to just get the short yards, get the tough yards, pass block. He still does a lot of really important things. He just doesn't do them at a high enough level to kind of warrant that $90 million contract. What running back does warrant a $90 million contract, some might ask, uh, and that's a pretty fair question. So a lot of problems going into Ezekiel Elliott, and with that, we go to our panic meter. <laughs> It's red. Again, it's one of these things where what happened with the Cowboys offense when Dak was under center? They looked absolutely terrible for the first 50 minutes of that game just because of Dak? Absolutely not. It was because they had one wide receiver out there and they had a banged up offensive line not doing them any favors. So as much as Michael Gallup has come back and looked good, I just don't think we're looking at the same top five scoring offense in Dallas that we thought we were before the season. This is a defensive-minded team with Michael Parsons emerging as one of the best players in the NFL and even if the Cowboys are willing to give Zeke 15 to 20 carries per game. I just think he's even, he's even behind guys like Damian Pierce and Dave Montgomery in terms of his overall usage with how involved Tony Pollard is. So if Tony Pollard ceases to exist, okay, something could happen with Zeke. Not telling you guys to cut him. You know, I still do think there could be slightly better days ahead, but I think Dak coming back, it's going to get Zeke more so into the low end RB2, borderline RB2 conversation. The days of looking at Ezekiel Elliott as a locked in top 12 RB1 are over. From Jimmy Jam in the chat, are we buying Allen Robinson? No, we are not buying Allen Robinson. Let's talk about just how much we should be panicking about the Rams' alleged wide receiver, too. So the big thing to remember with Allen Robinson, it's not that he's been bad. He has arguably been the worst wide receiver in the entire NFL among the guys that have gotten the opportunity to go out there on the field. So on the season, PFF receiving grade. There's been 84 wide receivers with at least 15 targets. Allen Robinson ranks. 83rd yards per route run 83rd yards per reception 78th targets per route run dead last nobody has earned t targets at a lower rate on their routes than Allen robinson this season and yeah you know we can go back to august we can read all the fluff pieces about how is you know route running is going to be so utilized by sean McVay and matthew stafford loves having him out there we're still waiting to see it guys and so far through five weeks only chase claypool is averaging fewer yards per target than Allen robinson under 25 yards in four or five games this season. Again, 25 yards. It's not that he's been relatively bad. We're talking about the wide receiver 76. This has been unusable bad in an offense that we talked about. There's so many problems going on that, no, I don't think Allen Robinson is the worst wide receiver in the NFL. Certainly doesn't look good, though. And then when you add on the fact that, oh, this offensive line is terrible. Oh, Matthew Stafford isn't playing good. And, oh, Matthew Stafford 
literally, guys, targets Cooper Cup and Tyler Higby at a higher rate than any other pair of teammates in the NFL. So I know that's that, you know, with Cooper and Higby, it's a little bit like the Kobe Bryant and Kwame Brown, you know, combining for 81 points or whatever. But seriously, Tyler Higby is getting force fed the ball, too. That's why he's the tight end six on the season. So we have Cooper Cup. We have Tyler Higby. I remain just a little bit hopeful on Cam Akers eventually taking over this backfield. Otherwise, guys, though, no, not feeling good about Allen Robinson. And I'll show you how much I don't feel good about him. Bring up the panic meter. I got eight players for you guys, and A-Rob is the only one in dark red. I said last week on the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast that more shallow leagues could cut him. He does not need to be someone you're keeping through the bye. It could only get worse for him, honestly, because we look at this, and OBJ is expected to come back in November, maybe to the Rams, maybe not. Van Jefferson is someone, too, that hasn't played in this offense throughout the season. He could come off IR at some point, and God forbid something happens to Matthew Stafford, one of the worst backup quarterback situations in the league over there in L.A. So, unfortunately, Allen Robinson. He's been bad with his volume. He's not getting any volume, and I just don't see any reason to expect either of those factors to change in a meaningful way anytime soon. From Ray FFA, DJ Moore is killing me. Help. Yeah, man, he's killing all of us, and let's talk about it here with the Panthers' number one wide receiver, but just the wide receiver 49 in fantasy this season. So overall, PPR wide receiver 58, 29, 94, 29, and 39 finishes on the year. The problem, guys, is that DJ Moore, he's not getting enough opportunity to make up for the brutal efficiency that this offense has brought out in him. I would never call DJ Moore a bad receiver. We've all seen way too much evidence to suggest that he is the opposite of that. But when you have a good receiver and a bad offense with a terrible quarterback that's not throwing the ball very much, you know, now all of a sudden that talent doesn't have many opportunities to win out in the first place. So in Carolina, DJ Moore, yeah, he has a team high 37 targets. Christian McCaffrey's at 35 right behind him. And, oh, Robbie Anderson at 27 right there as well. Would you guys have guessed that Robbie Anderson actually leads the Panthers in receiving yards? Because he does, not DJ Moore. And, again, it comes down to the fact that it's not even that surprising that DJ Moore hasn't put up better numbers. If you look at his workload at PFF, we have some expected fantasy points data. All it does is just look at the exact targets the guy's got downfield end zone. They take away what actually happens. So we can just basically see what the workloads of all these guys are. And DJ Moore is only the wide receiver 40 and expected PPR points per game. So yeah, that's better than the wide receiver 49 right there. I don't hate buying low on DJ Moore because we can look at him as someone that, Hey, when's the value going to get any lower than it is? right now i'm just not all that certain that we're going to see him actually boom up to top 24 heights and to be fair you know i'm throwing alan robinson under the bus a lot because of some of his again terrible efficiency measures and it is a two-way street trying to throw and catch the ball dj moore is also popping up in some of these horrendous metrics so this year the only guys worse than dj moore in terms of yards per target chase claypool alan robinson and hunter renfro has been dealing with a bunch of injuries so let's go to our panic meter I'm red on DJ, not quite as bad as Allen Robinson, but it's just the reality that right now we have an injured version of Baker Mayfield. Guessing that's not going to be better than the non-injured version of Baker Mayfield. God bless PJ Walker. I'm a huge XFL fan. I watched every single snap that dude took. There's a reason why he was in the XFL and not the NFL. And now the main coach, his former head coach at Temple, that got him into the uh, NFL in the first place, no longer there to help guide him. Guys, like what we're praying that Sam Darnold comes back healthy. That's the point we've gotten to with the DJ Moore era. It's just unfortunately not an efficient enough offense, and it's too crowded for DJ Moore to bust out in that. When we look at these other bad passing games, Brandon Cooks in Houston, CeeDee Lamb in Dallas, why are they overcoming it? Because they're complete target hogs. That has not been the case for DJ Moore this year. Again, I'm not putting most of the blame on him. I'm putting it on the offensive environment, the coaches, the quarterback. Unfortunately, those things all matter when we're trying to look at DJ Moore's fantasy production. I am not expecting things to get better for him in a meaningful way anytime soon. So that was our Panic or Relax segment. Appreciate you guys as always. Now we're getting some personalized fantasy advice. Let's jump into personalized fantasy advice presented by State Farm, where the personal price plan is all about creating a price just for you. From Kelly, Jacoby Myers, or Jalen Waddle, got to still be Jalen Waddle for me, especially with the fact that Tyree Kill, not 100% with that foot injury. Uh, Pro Football Talk did report on Sunday that Tyreek is tentatively expecting to play through the pain and still be out there this week. But with Jalen Waddle, guys, 
it's not so much a bet on, you know, if this offense is going to be fantastic with Skylar Thompson under center. It's a bet on Jalen Waddle being a freakish talent in his own right. And Mike McDaniel, their head coach, just doing a good job getting him the ball in easy ways. The Dolphins use more pre-snap motion than any team in the league. Top three in play action. I think Waddle is too good with, again, a coach that knows how to get him the ball to warrant putting on the bench. But Kobe Myers in full PPR, still a viable wide receiver three. From Simdog, Mostert, Singletary, or A.J. Dillon. That's going to be a close one. I do lean just barely towards A.J. Dillon still this week. Now, we have seen the usage going a little bit sideways. Again, I have all three of these guys ranked fairly close to together. I'd feel a lot better about Raheem Mostert if he didn't miss practice on Wednesday with this new injury. So Mostert did come out and say he's going to be out there. But ultimately, we have A.J. Dillon as a touchdown favorite at home against the Jets. I mean, if this isn't the week to really target him and expect it to happen, when will it happen for A.J. Dillon? From Eagles fan, should I worry about Aaron Jones? I don't think so. If anything, A.J. Dillon would be the guy to worry more about because the Jones usage has been increasing on a week-to-week basis. And guys, just in terms of the best overall running backs this year, Jones should be in anyone's top five. Every week I tweet out this chart that on the x-axis it has you know yards after contact per carry, on the y it has missed tackles force per carry. Just two independent situations where you can look at running back performance without offensive lines or quarterback and stuff like that. We got Nick Chubb. Absolutely balling out like he does every year. Josh Jacobs, fantastic talent this year. Aaron Jones is going to be your next best running back in terms of those two factors. So we know how great he is as a receiver. Still don't think we've seen the best version of this Packers offense. Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon, I still believe, are going to be consistent. Top 20 fantasy running backs more weeks than not. Will Jones really give us that, you know, super sky high Alvin Kamara, Christian McCaffrey as ceiling? That would probably be a no for me. But still someone that you're going to like to have in your fantasy lineups far more weeks than not. From KPAT12, three QBs you want to stream next week. Yeah, guys, I know you might not have that many problems this week on the buys in terms of the quarterbacks because the teams on buys, you know, we just weren't using all that much anyway, with all due respect to Jared Goff. But next week, we got the Bills, the Vikings, the Eagles, and the Rams all on bye week. So a couple reasonable options if you want to get ahead of the game and cover that up. First of all, Kenny Pickett going up against the Dolphins defense that has been bad, period, bottom five defense and pretty much any passing metric you want to look at. And they're banged up by Aaron Jones, their number one cornerback, has not been able to come back off the pup list all season long. And Mike McDaniel even confirmed his recovery from that Achilles injury is not going as planned. So not expecting Byron Jones back anytime soon. Xavier Howard has been out there, not really doing well, and now he's trying to play through a groin injury. So when you have your starting two cornerbacks both banged up, I don't like their chances of hanging with George Pickens and Deontay Johnson all that well. So Kenny Pickett, yeah, not been the best so far. We have seen those four interceptions. Maybe only one of them really his fault, but I do think we've seen him, given his great wide receivers, a chance to go make some plays. Hopefully Tua is back by then and we can see a sneaky shootout of sorts. I would also point out that Daniel Jones and Marcus Mariota, guys are on pace to post top five numbers at the quarterback positions in terms of total rush attempts. You look at Daniel Jones versus Jacksonville, Marcus Mariota at the Bengals. Again, two more matchups where wouldn't be the most surprised to see a potential sneaky shootout uh, emerge. And finally, Jameis Winston facing the Cardinals on Thursday night football, assuming he and some of his receivers are a bit healthier. From Co. Juju, Rondale, or Hurst in the flex. Ron Dale Moore, guys, got to go to it. Again, you look at this Seattle Seahawks defense. They haven't been terrible against the pass overall, but specifically against wide receivers in the slot. This is the matchup we want to get going on. Rondale, we couldn't trust him last week because we didn't know if he was going to completely displace Greg Dortch across the top of the depth chart. He did. And again, the Seahawks defense, 31st in yards per attempt allowed to wide receivers lined up out of the slot. 32nd passing touchdown rate allowed, 32nd explosive pass play rate allowed, 31st in QB rating allowed. So Rondale Moore, 100%. B-Hud, is Mike Williams a week-to-week must start? Yeah, we call him a boomer bus wide receiver, guys. Mike Williams has been a boomer, 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 boom, or bus wide receiver this year. He's like the only wide receiver where he has a bad game. We just immediately jump on top of it and we say, yeah, take away all the great games. And what do you have? Well, you're taking away a lot of great games to kind of make your ill-advised point in the first place. So if Keenan Allen is back in the picture this week, it's not going to be completely ideal. We do know that we're not going to have quite as high as a target ceiling, but Mike Williams is one of those guys, man, you just got to live with the booms and under, you got to, excuse me, live with the seldom uh, bust here and there and accept that he's going to boom more times than not. They gave him that 60 million contract over this off season for a reason. Even if you don't love Mike Williams, Just love Justin Herbert's number one or number two wide receiver. Maybe that'll help you look at it. From Rahul, 
Mooney or Curtis Samuel in the flex. I'm still going to go with Curtis Samuel here. It's just more of a factor of volume here. Darnell Mooney's been playing great, though. It's not helping us as much in fantasy, but that one-handed OBJ snag last week, he had another diving catch downfield uh, two weeks ago, and last week could have honestly been a lot bigger. Two different opportunities for touchdowns, unfortunately. Couldn't quite get a better ball from Justin Fields. So Mooney, the talent, still very much a great wide receiver, in my opinion. But yeah, Curtis Samuel just getting force-fed targets in those low average average target depth areas of the field just gives him a far higher week to week floor, especially in full PPR from TV Dobbins or Brian Robinson to start this week. Oh, it's a tough one. I'm going to lean towards JK Dobbins just as more basically I think both these backfields are going to continue to have three running backs involved. We've seen this in Washington where last week, guess who had the most snaps? Not Gibson, not Brian Robinson. It was J.D. McKissick, which happens every single time Washington starts to trail in a game. But there's three running backs involved, not just one, not just two. Unfortunately, that's the case in Baltimore as well. So I really see Robinson and Dobbins having a pretty equal carry, uh, you know, just alignment with each other. And then at that point, do we want the Baltimore Ravens offense or the Washington Commanders offense? I will take the Ravens. Would I trade Jeff Wilson for Amari Cooper? Yes, Jets, great trade. I would do that. The thing with Jeff Wilson, he's been doing well with his touches, but Tyrion Davis-Price back at practice this week. Kyle Shanahan, longtime BFF, Tevin Coleman, already starting to eat into that workload. And unfortunately in San Francisco, they're tied with the Ravens and dead last in terms of targets to their running back. We're not getting those. We're always going to have Kyle Juszczyk doing Kyle Juszczyk things. Debo Samuel is going to do Debo Samuel things. So we really need one running back in San Francisco in order to be expecting anything resembling, you know, consistent fantasy production. And don't forget Elijah Mitchell on IR with that knee injury. Not a given. He's going to be out for the entire season. So awesome chance to go trade Jeff Wilson for someone in Amari Cooper that, Hey, with Jacoby Brissett leading this top 10 ranked scoring offense, we've already gotten some nice booms for Amari Cooper. I think Wilson versus Amari Cooper is a fairly reasonable, uh, you know, start sit dilemma during any given week right now. Guys, once Deshaun Watson back is down the stretch for the fantasy playoffs, it's not even going to be close. Amari Cooper is going to be a weekly must start. And at that point, who even knows if Jeff Wilson is still going to be the RB1 in San Francisco? From J Mob, should I be scared about James Conner? You shouldn't be thrilled about James Conner. He's out for at least this week. Does seem like it could be a multi-week injury. They didn't put him on IR, which is good. So we're not expecting him to be missing, you know, boatloads of time. But yeah, it's not great to have this running back with a long injury history. Now be experiencing another injury. Hope you were able to go get, you know, Benjamin in the meantime. And last one, everybody, classic JP, Mixon or Deontay Johnson or just panic. Yeah, I think I think you're good going with Joe Mixon. Again, he leads the NFL in touches. He's been the RB15 in PPR points per game. That sucks. He drafted him as a top 10 running back, not a top 15. Uh, you know, he did draft him to be the RB15. But think about that. That's really pretty much his floor with this usage that he is able to get this year. So unfortunately, he's 0 for 7 on rush attempts inside the five-yard line, trying to convert those into touchdowns. We did see him last week finally start getting some room to run yards per carry not the most you know predictive stat and just i understand it's more of an offensive stat than a specific running back but over five last week expecting bigger and better, better things out of this Bengals offense and again the usage is there for a player that we still know is good i am not panicking on joe mixon or deontay johnson for that matter with deontay this year no touchdowns yet only 53 and a half yards per game Guys, I had never been more confident that Deontay Johnson is an elite receiver. Every week on Monday night, I post an article, my Shisha report. I go through all the nullified touchdowns, you know, the guys that were open and got a bad pass or the guys that dropped a touchdown. Deontay Johnson is on this list every single week, usually multiple occasions. And yeah, we have had a couple drops here and there. But more than anything, it's him using that incredible route running ability, getting open, and unfortunately dealing a bit too much with Trubisky and young Kenny Pickett experience. With that said, Follow that volume, follow that talent, buy low on Deontay Johnson. Guys, that's going to wrap it up here. Another edition of BR Fantasy. Again, this has been presented by State Farm. Always love those guys and love you guys for tuning in with us each and every week. Go out there, get that W in week six. We'll be right back here in week seven. Until then, take care, everybody.